Thank you for coming. It's, very, uh, it's a very familiar spot for Rick and I, the community center. That's actually how we know each other, through Natasha, which is walking around with some chocolate. Do you want to tell us what she's handing out? So we decided to bribe everybody, every one of you with uh, chocolate, of course. I, I, I would be doing my job if I just talked about a book, because at the end of the day, I'm a chocolate maker. So we brought two special new chocolates that we're doing right now, a goat's milk chocolate and a sheep's milk chocolate. So we thought that was very vineyard appropriate, but uh, it's, they're both uh, really exciting. Is, are they, um, does, there's less lactose in those. Is that a consideration? Yeah, exactly. I think that there's, yeah, I think that those that are lactose intolerant, they can definitely handle uh, uh, sheep and goat much better than, than cow milk. Um, okay, well, and Kathy's now started the rounds too. Um, well, as you guys know, probably are here, have seen the book. This is Rick's um, book that came out last spring. Uh, published with his brother, Mike, who, where is Mike? Actually, right now, Michael, my brother's at a funeral right now, so yeah. Sorry, I brought it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and we'll give him one more second for the chocolate distractions, as they call it. Um, let you savor it. Any thoughts on the chocolate, Hans? Any notes of kohlrabi? Okay. Yeah. So I'll just uh, expand a little bit on Rick's bio, if I can, and he can can expand on that further, but uh, Rick makes chocolate in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is the, has become the symbol in food and other artisanal crafts um, for really representing this resurgence of handmade, high quality products uh, all over the world. Um, uh, I was in Tokyo this winter and there's a big Brooklyn Industries thing. I know there's a big Brooklyn shop in Paris, which uh, you may or may not have anything to do with, but. I guess my first question for Rick would be, um, not only are you on the cutting edge of, of chocolate making in America and, and have influences probably such as Chilmark chocolates, but how do you feel that you fit into uh, this larger idea of, of what Brooklyn has become? Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, I definitely, uh, that's a great question to start with, to start right <laughs> off. And I think that, uh, Right from the beginning, we talked about this this earlier. What got us into chocolate wasn't just about chocolate itself. It was about to be a part of something greater than chocolate, greater than ourselves, to be a part of really a, a movement. And um, it started with a curiosity, a curiosity for how things are made. And I think that that's, that was kind of the spark of this whole movement that, that you could credit Brooklyn for, but it's really happening all around the world. But uh, just it's a it's a passion and a curiosity for how things are made, particularly those things that are that there's such a contradiction between people's universal love for and lack of understanding of, which I would put chocolate as being one of those <coughs> premier things of the most you know I've I've said it a hundred times the most popular food on earth yet nobody knows how it's made <laughs> and uh, it all started really with my brother and I in our apartment in Brooklyn we've told the story a lot almost a decade ago at this point believe it or not. Um, kind of sitting down and wondering, can you make chocolate from scratch in your kitchen? A basic question like that. And, uh, you know, I was, I, I, I'm a trained cook. I went to culinary school. I had been curing meats. I've been interested in all those kind of things. Uh, and you, you cooked know. here on Martha's Vineyard, too. Yep, cooked at the outermost over here. Um, and uh, just really curious about how things are made. Uh, it really started with that as opposed to chocolate itself. Um, I've... I, you know, I didn't grow up just loving chocolate. I think I grew up not knowing what great chocolate was. And it may sound um, um, a bit, I don't know what the right word is, but I really didn't know I liked chocolate until I tasted the first batch that came out of our own apartment and thought, oh, chocolate is a food. It was this big kind of uh, exciting moment for us to think, oh, chocolate is a food. It's and not a candy bar that you buy at the gas station on a, on a road trip. It's a, it's a real thing. I, I have no idea really what the process is like. Will you explain how you make chocolate in your apartment in Brooklyn? Right, so let me, yeah. So let me, let me, let me step back for a second and just, 
So what makes Mass Brothers, what makes, what really uh, def has defined Mass Brothers is that we started making chocolate from scratch, from the bean, from bean to bar in our apartment a long time ago, then turned it into a business. So we were, um, we had that conversation around the dinner table. How do you make chocolate from scratch? How do you get a cocoa bean? Um, and, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for, because all of a sudden, my brother and I and our other roommate all of a sudden had a couple burlap bags of beans in our living room and these little makeshift stone grinders on our counter and uh, were, you know, had basically turned our, our apartment into a weekend chocolate factory. And uh, um, so cut to, uh, to now, 2015, we have a chocolate factory in our kind of flagship chocolate factories in Brooklyn and Williamsburg. Um, and then we just opened in London. Um, we're actually the first bean to bar chocolate maker in London. Um, and we opened there in Shoreditch in February. And um, we're currently building, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to announce this formally, but I will anyhow, but <laughs> we're gonna be, we're building a chocolate, full bean to bar chocolate factory in Los Angeles right now. So, Congratulations. Yeah. And we're gonna do a, a chocolate factory in Tokyo, we decided. Yeah, we decided we're gonna do it together. We just, this, yeah. this is our <laughs> announcement here. Um, <laughs> And he has big plans for Lincoln, Lincoln Center, apparently. Yeah, talk to me about that afterwards. Yep. Um, so Rick grew up in Iowa um, and had a very interesting path leading to the chocolate world, uh, which included studies in opera, uh, working in record stores in LA, cooking in some of the best kitchens in Manhattan, and then went on this endeavor. And I see with this book, uh, something about the, the Mass Brothers that always appealed to me was their aesthetic quality. And when you visit their stores, now there's multiple stores, you get the sense that every detail is considered. And uh, I think, and, and Rick said to me before the interview, what was exciting about chocolate to him was not what other people were doing, was the fact that there was so much room for innovation. Um, and so... Right now, he's making some of the best chocolate in the world, but he's also, do you want to explain, um, well, first of all, it, it'd be very interesting for me to hear some of your influences uh, just for everything, because this book is so beautiful in every way, and your chocolate bars are so beautiful. But, um, and secondly, also, some of the innovations that you guys are working on, because they're exciting. Yeah, I mean, I mean what we made our name being an innovative you know, group. So uh, what, what makes me curious is about, is about exploring new ideas. So that's why we got into chocolate in the first place. Um, uh, he mentioned that I have a background in, in opera and classical music, and I always thought, basically, not to go on a divergence here, but uh, I will anyhow, because it's... That's the point uh, yeah, of yeah. this. <laughs> uh, but uh, I studied classical music at a small Lutheran college in, uh, in Iowa. And when I was really started getting obsessed into opera, and I actually, I think I cite it more and more in my, as I get older, as being uh, very much a, a, a big influencer in my approach to chocolate. And that's that when I saw opera, I saw this amazing opportunity for it to be reinvented. That it has all of these core components that everybody has a certain understanding, or they, they know of it, but they don't really understand what it's made of. And yet, there's sort of this, I, I would refer to almost like a cheapened culture around opera that could just be so brilliant if you really understood what the core components of opera is. And I thought it was, I, I was destined to reinvent it. And <laughs> um, I think that, I, you know, I'm my, my path took me to culinary school and to, uh, to chocolate, but that's my approach to chocolate is to continuously reinvent it, to continuously innovate it. So right now, what we've just done, and you might, might have read about it, there's been little peeps here and there about it, but we started brewing cocoa beans, and uh, so we've made a non-alcoholic beer out of it, much along the lines of ginger beer or root beer, and uh, it's a really exciting thing to reinvent chocolate as a beverage. What is chocolate as a beverage? Is it just the creamy, frothy thing you get in Brussels, or could it be something new and refreshing and vibrant and uh, much more relevant to the world of coffee and, and craft beer that we live in right now? And, I, now I'm, you know, now I'm of course obsessed with that. So. And and uh, this winter I also tried his cocoa nib tea. Is that what you're calling it? Yeah. It's uh, is that using spent cocoa nibs from the roasting process or? Yeah, we also we're also so we're basically brewing cocoa beans in every way possible, um, and we're doing it um, hot brewed. So we do pour overs. We do we put it in tea bags. You can make a tea out of it. Um, then you can also do siphon brewing with it, which is a great way to extract cocoa beans. But um, all these things are just innovations that just purely exist in the bubble of our factories. So 
um, unfortunately, you guys all have to go there. And, for uh, now. Yeah, yeah, to taste it for now. Yeah. And um, speaking of innovation, I had an idea which you haven't quite latched on to. In Tokyo, <laughs> in Tokyo, I read recently about baths that you can go to. You can take a bath in ramen. Yeah. I think for the L.A. spot, he should have chocolate vats that it's sort of like a spa treatment that yeah. you can bathe in chocolate. Does anybody else agree that might work in L.A.? Does anybody live in L.A.? Chocolate Do they baths. want chocolate baths? Yeah. Chocolate bars, chocolate beers, and chocolate baths. That's great. So you, I mean, your bars are in, in many stores now, and you've told me about the good problem that you have of keeping up. The last time we saw each other was for another musical um, thing that music is a huge part in, in Rick's life and, and in the store and goes back to all the eclectic influences. Um, but the last time I saw him, he was working 24 hours a day to try to just keep up with the demand because they've, they've done such a great job with their product. Um, he's gotten endorsements from the most incredible uh, culinary leaders from Thomas Keller to Alice Waters um, and on and on and on. Um, can you tell me about what it was like to serve Thomas Keller the first time and, and how he got your chocolate or, or, sure. or how that worked out? Well, you can see, actually, we were lucky enough. Thomas Keller's become quite the mentor of ours. He wrote the foreword to our uh, cookbook. And he's in your um, book trailer, which is really yep. great. Yep, if and we coerce him. They made a video book trailer that's yep. fantastic. But we've been really lucky. You know, it's, it's something that I've been really fortunate of. I've been thinking a lot about it recently, and that's the world that my brother and I have created has been so lucky. We get people like Chris. We get people like all of you. We get people like Thomas Keller. Uh, Daniel Hum and um, uh, Will Gadara at 11 Madison Park. There's actually a Mast Brothers course now. So it's the penultimate course of the chef's tasting. They just present Mast Brothers chocolate bars to you to present our milk collection. Be like, hey, did you guys know that Mast Brothers do milk chocolate? Here you go. What do you guys think? And I mean, that's a crazy, that's crazy. You know what I mean? So that's the awesome. idea of, to, so it really makes you realize how lucky we are to have all these amazing people in our lives. But uh, Thomas Keller, who wrote the foreword, has become a real great mentor and really just these amazing people just giving us great advice about life, fatherhood, growing a company. Um, usually more broad things like that than tweaking chocolate recipes. It's usually more about uh, how, to, how to say no to opportunity, um, how to balance family, um, how, to, how to be a good person, those kind of things. Um, we'll go back to Brooklyn for a second. Um, after working in Manhattan, which um, I see a lot of people that have had success in Brooklyn come from Manhattan to get that more formal training and then put their, their spin on it. Do you feel like you could shave your beard at this point and it'd be okay? It's a question I ask myself every morning, in the, every morning when I'm looking in the mirror, especially <laughs> on hot New York days. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's, a pretty funny, that's actually a pretty funny question. It's, like, it's amazing. It'll feel really good. If I go through a big midlife crisis... I think I can just shave my beard and uh, just feel really... For know, those that don't know, there's a lot of beards in, yeah. in Brooklyn. Yeah. Maybe more mustaches, but yeah. Yeah. Um, every, musta every beard starts with a mustache. Some people, bl some people will blame my brother and I for that, and uh, we, we will we'll accept responsibility for, some, for at least some of that. Yeah. Um, will you explain to, to our listeners here um, your choices about your packaging yeah. and where that came from, where those influences came from? Yeah, so as Chris said, I mean, I'm really passionate about considering every detail. So the word consider, con, to be considered is something very important to us. Every little detail, and it's all in the name of simplicity. It's the name of simplicity and the name of clarity. So um, our, our chocolate bars are, there's, there's way more thought that has gone into every chocolate bar than you ever could imagine, and it's almost embarrassing to describe it. But the roots in it, and we've, I've written about it in the book, the roots in opening a Mass Brothers chocolate bar and the wrappers are in, the, in a butcher shop. So the inspiration was going to the butcher, that in our efforts to always communicate that chocolate is food, we wanted to make sure that you could buy our chocolate bar from, the whole, from Whole Foods or from your local specialty market and still get that feeling. So we chose, in fact, in the early days, we just wrapped it in butcher paper when we were kind of messing around with different um, um, ideas. And then it had a simple sticker on the back. And that experience of sticking your finger and breaking the seal of the sticker, uh, and then op opening up this nice, thick, thick paper that's keeping it fresh is such an emotional, nostalgic experience for me as a lover of going to the butcher shop or the cheesemonger or your fishmonger that I wanted to make sure that that ex exact experience was um, 
was experienced when opening a chocolate bar. So that's where that that's that's where that came. That's why for for many years, um, every single Mass Brothers bar was meticulously hand wrapped by hand, and we had these stick every sticker is placed on it. Now we actually, if you visit our shop, you can see we found in Switzerland these 1950s bar wrappers that would do the that that could almost emulate perfectly exactly how we were hand wrapping them. So we had the machine shipped to the Bronx, that to this old place that specialized in refurbishing you know, vintage confectionery equipment, believe it or not, still exists. And, uh, uh, and they completely refurbished it to custom make for our chocolate bar. And it's actually one of the most amazing pieces of equipment that you've ever seen, about 100,000 moving parts, all to make this perfect bar. I mean, it's just a, it's a marvel on to its own. To wrap the perfect yeah, bar. Yeah, to wrap the perfect <laughs> bar, yeah. So, yeah, and then the, uh, the designs of them, you know, we're very much an in-house an in-house company, you know, we're like a little uh, Parisian atelier where we want to have full control over every little aspect of, of it. And we actually, the designs of them have kind of taken on a life of their own where uh, we actually redesign the entire line every year and then launch it in the fall. So it goes against every business person's advice to say that you want to have some sort of brand branding continuity, but it's become such a spectacular thing now where now we have these, we have literally these, these fashion icons contacting us wondering what the next line is going to look like and we'll send them a little sneak peek to see if we're going to be still into you know are we going to be into bold are we going to be into you know what palette what color palettes are we working with are we going to be doing repetitive patterns are they going to be asymmetrical so it's gotten really exciting to create this this world of it's not just about chocolate it's this whole world of consideration of considered details amazing yeah. um in cooking, in, in the cooking you were doing before, um, and, and making chocolate is cooking, certainly, um, seasonal considerations are on the forefront of every, every conversation, which is almost to a fault. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about seasonal chocolate making? Yeah, seasonal chocolate. How many people here have been to a cocoa farm before? So isn't that crazy? I mean, isn't that so wild? But just the idea, I mean, just even just when people walk into our shop and we see the burlap bags of beans sitting there and you can just grab them and you realize that 90% of the people that walk into our shop haven't seen a cocoa bean before. But when I say the word chocolate, you guys all instantly smile as if I'm talking about your child. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's such an, an, an amazing thing. So, so chocolate is seasonal in a different kind of way. Um, you know, but uh, it's not seasonal um, like, you know, uh, kale is on Martha's Vineyard. It's seasonal. There's probably two harvests per year, although they're kind of harvesting year round. Um, we're sourcing beans from all around the world, so um, uh, it's really interesting for us to have you. It's less seasonal and more geographic, I mm -hmm. guess, when it comes to the flavors that we're we're pulling off. So we're sourcing from Peru. We're sourcing from Belize. We're sourcing from Venezuela. We're sourcing from Madagascar, from Tanzania. Um, and all of these places have really unique flavor profiles that we try to heighten. Um, the seasonality is based on harvest. So if you have two harvests per year, those could be completely different. So not only does Tanzania have a pretty unique flavor profile, it'll change based on the harvest. And if you're a industrial chocolate maker, that's really difficult to deal with because a Hershey's bar is supposed to taste like a Hershey's bar. So if the, if the cocoa beans, one season, one harvest, are, uh, taste different than they do the, the previous one, how can you make a, a Hershey's bar taste like a Hershey's bar? You need that consistency of flavor. So we've decided to build our whole business model based on inconsistency, a celebration of the unique characteristics of the ingredients. That's how we define craft food in general, but that's how we define craft chocolate. A celebration of the unique characteristics of its ingredients. So if you truly celebrate them, that means that the you know, 2013 harvest of our Madagascar beans is much different than the 2014. And we're not trying to make a Madagascar bar to fit a Mad Madagascar profile. And we're not trying to make a Mass Brothers bar to fit a Mass Brothers profile. Now, by doing that, we've created a very, actually created a very specific identity. Um, uh, but it's all, very, it's all very thrilling. It's all very exciting. And what, uh, how involved with the sourcing process are you? Uh, my brother does more of the sourcing. I'm mm -hmm. more of the the chocolate making guy. My brother's the one that travels the most. Uh, we're both going to Peru in about next month. Um, <coughs> but uh, we have, at this point, we have um, just have amazing relationships with farmers to the point where farmers come with us and they'll come to us. They'll come to our holiday parties. They'll come to uh, make chocolate with us. 
um, you know, long time relationships. And and is everyone familiar familiar with the word terroir? Basically, the flavor of the place, flavor of whatever you're consuming, comes from the place it's grown. With cocoa beans, are there different varieties of cocoa beans, or is it one variety, like similar to the oyster, that is just picking up different characteristics of the environment that it's grown in? Yeah, so absolutely. In fact, Thomas Keller had a great quote to me. He said, you know, when it comes to wines, I believe in terroir, but I'm not a terroirist. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> I, met so, a feta, I met a feta fetishist last night. <laughs> but uh, yes, so, I mean, in general, uh, the terroir made me... So a cocoa, a cocoa tree is a little bit taller than I am, and if I'm a cocoa tree, the pods are growing on my trunk. They don't grow out like apples, they grow on your trunk. And they're pods about this big. And when you open them up, there's the seeds, and the seeds really make fun of, make, make up the majority of what's inside. There's a little bit of a white pulp uh, surrounding those seeds, but it's those seeds that, that make chocolate. So um, uh, they're, they're really seeds. Uh, now you ferment those, after those are, har those are harvested, those seeds are taken out of the pods, then they're fermented. Uh, they're fermented on the farm, and um, uh, They'll ferment it from anywhere from three to six days, and uh, it's... Are they fermented by just exposing them Yeah, to exactly. It's all wild fermentation in these kind of wooden black boxes, and um, uh, it really develops a lot of great flavor. Mm -hmm. And then they're dried out in the sun, or uniquely in Papua New Guinea, they are um, uh, smoke-dried. So you can impart this really beautiful smokiness to it. Um, that's interesting. That's yeah. my favorite. Uh, that's what we served at the yeah. Beach Plum. Um, yeah, yeah. And to speak on that, you know, you've had all these chefs' endorsements, mm -hmm. and, and we, yeah. we served your chocolate as a, as a, it was a constant on our menu, yeah. and so we were very blessed to have that product yeah. too. And um, so, and, and what do you, do you get it into the pairing of chocolate with other things at all? Are you, I mean, you have different flavors. You have a sea salt, you have some uh, with Aleppo pepper or spice, or is it chili pepper yep. you were doing? Uh, what are other combinations that you're working, or are you are you innovating in that sense too? Yeah, constantly. I mean, uh, how many people here prefer dark over milk? <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, how many people prefer their dark chocolate to be just as is, or with something with some nuts in it, or something like that? Oh, oh. oh it's sorry. Uh, just <laughs> plain dark chocolate. Something and then the rest are something with it with something. So, so basically, we appreciate all of those things. I, first of all, milk chocolate. We just launched milk chocolate. You guys all just had some sheep's milk chocolate and some goat's milk chocolate right now. Uh, a lot of chocolate makers uh, in our world are were kind of they would shy away from milk chocolate. You know, as a point of pride, we don't do my, milk chocolate. We only do dark milk. If we were to do milk chocolate, it would be a dark milk chocolate. It'd be much better for you. All these things. <laughs> and I decided, you know what? If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to really go for it. Let's so let's approach milk chocolate like like we how we define our company. I like like a craft chocolate company should one that celebrates the unique characteristics of its ingredients. So we started celebrating milk, and uh, I'm a huge fan of cheeses. Have a lot of great staff members that are amazing. We're amazing cheesemongers and cheese makers, and we started sourcing amazing sheep's milks and goats milks and cows milks <coughs> and butter milks. And we do a buffalo milk for Eleven Madison Park. We do. Uh, uh, we've got all sorts of amazing. Do amazing you milk milks. the buffalo? <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. Believe it or not, you can't get good buffalo milk in the United States. You have to go to uh, England. That's where hmm. you get the best buffalo milk. Yeah. Um, and and I think that's the thing that draws me. Obviously, hearing Rick talk and his excitement and the effort of putting, you know, getting a, a wrapper from Sweden and refurbishing it, and that's what craftsmanship to me is, is that attention to detail and that effort. And then as a consumer, you want to support that. Um, he went to even further extremes a few years ago, and, and I'm not sure if you actually had the boat built or there was found somebody with a boat in Falmouth, and they sailed to the Dominican Republic picked up all the chocolate, and then sailed it back. And um, do you want to tell us a little bit about why you did that? Because that's a little bit crazy. <laughs> and yeah. So basically, you know, it's just, again, it's just about following. If I'm not passionate about something, if I'm not, if it doesn't just make me feel like I have to do it, otherwise the world is going to crumble, I just won't be bothered. So uh, to me, it was about, OK, we're spending all this time making chocolate from bean to bar. We're, we're meticulously sourcing our beans. 
well, how are they getting here? We're not really attacking every aspect of our chocolate making until we decide, we figure out how the beans are getting from Central America to Brooklyn, you know, because we kind of, we're letting some other importer do that. And why, do, why would we care so much about every other detail and let that be? So uh, over a late night conversation with my brother and I, I was like, oh, we should just sail them. It just makes so much more sense. We should just <laughs> sail the beans. Uh, you know, wind is free. It'll probably be cheaper. You know, I mean, you don't have to pay for all that gas. It'll be really easy. We'll be able to find a really cool boat. Uh, it'll make all the sense in the world. So, of course, <laughs> to you. of course, some of those things are true, but they're very abstract. It's very utopian. It's very idealist. All those things. And once I just started, kept on, but I got so excited about it. I, in moments like this, you know, I was speaking a lot at the time. Uh, I was just telling people, this is what we're going to do. We're going to anybody sail listening? Beans. Yeah, people started listening. So, yeah. a friend of a friend. Um, <clears throat> Uh, basically, uh, through a, a long list of people, of c people put us in contact with a, a captain named Captain Eric Loftfield. He's based out of Falmouth. And ironically, he, his full-time job is being a captain of one of the world's largest container ships and oil riggers. And what he'd been doing in his spare time for the past 25, 30 years is building a, sa a sailing boat for cargo, to carry cargo. And he had never taken it out. It was still on, in his backyard. He'd been building it all this time. And he never had an excuse to use it. So uh, I met him with my brother. And we said, hey, well, this is perfect. You've got a boat right here. You've been working on it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we would love to charter it um, and uh, sail some beans that are waiting for us in Dominican Republic. And he thought, great. I have an excuse to use this boat. And uh, basically, long story short, about six months later, literally, he had, just fin he had finally had a reason to really finish it. He finished it customized the whole cargo cabinet uh, for uh, cocoa beans because there's a lot of considerations you need to do to, to be able to, to store, keep the humidity out and all sorts of things like that. Um, and uh, basically got a ragtag crew of his family uh, just because they had been, this boat had been, I mean, his kids had grown up with this boat in their backyard. I mean, it was like a fixture of the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and we did it. So we sailed 20 metric tons of cocoa beans using his vessel. And um, we're, we actually filmed the whole thing. We're going to put out a, a documentary short all about it in hopes to inspire. So he's 65 years old now. So it's not like we're going to be doing monthly trips to start getting all of our beans like that. And believe it or not, this is the only boat that can do it in the entire world that's set for cargo, that's licensed. He had, proper, he had a properly licensed, permitted for, 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 for sailing cargo. And there's just not another boat to do it. So our hope is, is to inspire people to think differently about every little aspect of it. And it seems crazy, and it is. Um, it seems unsustainable, probably, but maybe it's, maybe it, who knows? Um, at, least it, at least it makes people think a little bit differently. And it also will connect all of, now that you guys know this, you'll remember this story for the rest of your lives. You'll also eat a Mass Brothers chocolate bar wondering if this was made with those beans that was sailed. And that'll connect you to the Dominican Republic or to the fact that cocoa pods aren't just grown, you know, um, on Beetlebug Farm, you have to go to Dominican Republic, Peru, Brazil, um, all around this. It's a really, it's a global effort to make these chocolate bars. And uh, it just shows a sign of, a, a sense of play and adventure and exploration that chocolate should have. Because chocolate is a really amazing fruit and it takes so many people to make it happen. So to and, me, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's a very healthy yeah, very very healthy. Do you yeah. guys get into that side of of the health benefits? Do people ask you the H word constantly? Yeah. The H word. Yeah, I health. mean, yeah, we definitely chocolate is definitely a very healthy thing. But I don't think anybody here eats chocolate as part of a health regimen. They I eat do. it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think you eat it because you appreciate pleasure. You take your, or as e Charles Eames would say, uh, take your pleasure seriously. For people that take <laughs> their pleasure seriously, that's what. Our, that's what Master Brothers Chocolate is all about. If I could steal his quote and have that be our slogan, uh, that's what I would do. It's Mass Brothers is for people that take pleasure very seriously. So. Well, that's interesting. As somebody that grows vegetables, and, yep. and sometimes you grow vegetables that you, it takes convincing people to um, to buy them and eat them, and you yeah. have to coerce them with recipes, and, <laughs> yeah. and sometimes physically yeah. forcing it down their throat. Um, you, I mean, I've seen it at the chocolate factory, and if you haven't been to the Mass Brothers Chocolate Factory, it's just like you'd imagine. It's amazing. It smells incredible. There's little elves everywhere, um, <laughs> just dancing and singing, and they're not swimming in chocolate baths, but no. they should be. Um, 
but yeah, the, if if you haven't been to his factory, it's amazing. Um, you, it's in North Fifth, North Third Street in Williamsburg. Yeah, open every day with tours all the time. So um, yeah, it's that's really a new feature. it's really you know, we uh, we really take it seriously to try to introduce chocolate to the world. We want to introduce everybody to the whole chocolate process, to how it's done, to how it's made, to how it tastes, the different potential for it, and to kind of blow your mind so that the chocolate you grew up with is sort of Oh, well, there's more to it than than just and, that. And, and speaking of that too, with the book, which yeah. which is why we're here, because Rick wrote this beautiful book, um, and I guess Michael did too, but he's not here, so he doesn't get to take the credit. Um, <laughs> I mean, they collaborated with an amazing photographer. Mm -hmm. uh, the design of the book is amazing, and and there's also a huge savory food section. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite savory application of chocolate? Well, we, I, I like to connect people to where chocolate comes from, which is the beans. So um, if you can get your hands on some cocoa nibs, uh, you can make amazing dry rubs with it. So um, For meat? Yeah, for meat. Yeah, yeah. Beef, Beef. lamb, anything, yeah, anything. I think we've got yeah dry rub for steak in there. So it's just a really great classic. It'll become kind of a classic go-to uh, dry rub that will just be something a little different than what you uh You should package that. Have, yeah. But there's some famous things out there that are that are pretty pretty <laughs> classic. Ignore that. Suggestion. That are pretty classic that have chocolate in them. You know what I mean? That's of me. course, you have moles and stuff like that. But anybody ever heard of Cincinnati chili? It's a classic classic chili recipe that you often see chocolate being a part of. So uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of really amazing amazing. I mean, the the book, the way the book kind of um, kind of goes, the first recipe in it is just for chocolate milk. So I really wanted to re again. What, what's a chocolate milk look like if you carefully consider the, the ingredients within? So uh, just simple milk and great chocolate. And it, it is different. It is, it is more difficult to make, and we think that the rewards are, are, are that much greater. And then as the stories become more complex, we started getting into more complex recipes. Um, but it really is just a book of classic American desserts reinterpreted through the lens of a simple craft chocolate maker. So... Most of these recipes are one, you know, the recipes were the easy part. That was the part that we were, we've been making these recipes in our shop, most of the, but probably half of these on a day-to-day -day basis in our shop. <clears throat> but they're accompanied by these short stories in there that used to keep me up over, keep me up late at night because at the end of the day, I'm a chocolate maker, not a storyteller, but I love literature. So of course I felt like I can't just write something just I had to really, really again think about it, and it made it drove me crazy uh, thinking <laughs> about how these stories we're gonna we're gonna read. So uh, I'm hoping that people will enjoy those um, well, as much do. as everything I, else. I was in Gloucester last week cooking at a friend's restaurant, and their pastry chef brought this out and made your chocolate cake, and that was on the menu yeah. that night, and it was fantastic. So uh, thanks to books like this, I mean, it's that you are spreading the gospel in many different ways. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank Rick <laughs> for being here and promoting, and actually just thank you for what you're doing. But we also have, um, we have a few minutes left if anybody has any questions, and if you do, please ask them into the microphone. First of all, thank you for the samples. Yeah. Um, <laughs> second. Can you speak to the shelf life of chocolates? Because I, I've noticed that many people who do have their own chocolates say you have to eat it within two weeks, the homemade ones. So she was talking about the shelf life of chocolate. So chocolate is interesting. Uh, our chocolate bars, for instance, there's nothing that goes bad in them. So there's no, there's no I mean, there's, there's milk powder in ma that milk chocolate is made in, and that'll have a, a more of a limited shelf life. But for the most part, if it's stored properly, um, proper so proper storage, uh, as I infamously said on Martha Stewart one time, you store it where you keep your guns. So uh, you uh, you store it where it's in dry, your car? dry and cool. <laughs> yeah, oh. not in your glove compartment. Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah, where it's dry and cool. So you'd think that maybe sometimes I'd say you can get away with storing it maybe where you might store your red wine or, but even that might be a little too humid. But uh, where it's dry and cool is the right place to do it. But it'll last for a long time. So, so oh, yeah. uh, a year, it'll, a, a good chocolate bar, you can last for a year or two. In fact, Mass Brothers chocolate is uniquely aged uh, before we even temper it into bars. So, what you're probably referring to are more confections where there's a ganache on the inside. Ganache on the inside, then you've got a three week, you usually have about a three week turnaround for a, a handmade uh, chocolate with a ganache on the inside, which, because there's milk, there's moisture. Where there's moisture, there's a shelf life. Yeah. Uh, 
Be, being from Brooklyn, yeah. uh, do you make a Mass Brothers egg cream? Oh. Yeah, well, absolutely, <laughs> yes. So we've got an amazing egg cream recipe using Mass Brothers in the, in the book. So yes, absolutely. And in fact, our chocolate beer that I've been talking about is sort of, to me, a tribute in a way to, a, to an egg cream. It's sort of a, you know, dare I say, a modern version of the egg cream. Yeah. And, and do you serve egg creams at, at the factory? Absolutely. Yeah, oh. yeah. They're, they're, we call them chocolate beers, but they're, it's, it's very in much inspired by the classic we'll, Brooklyn egg we'll cream. We'll be there yeah. in September. All right. And, and thank you. I'm, I'm curious how uh, climate change is affecting coca beans and where they can be grown. Yeah, uh, yeah. He was uh, cl climate change and, and the growth of cocoa beans. So there's a lot in the news these days about um, about the price of cocoa beans and how it's fluctuating, how it's becoming more expensive, and that actually has more to do with um, kind of futures brokers and hedge funders than it does to do with actual climate change. The scariest thing when it comes to the cocoa bean. Uh, to sourcing cocoa beans are things like that, market manipulation, but also labor practices probably affect things more than cli climate change at this point. Um, there's a, when it comes to the quality, uh, the, the quality focused farmers in the world, we're, in, we're increasing in, in strong numbers. Um, where, where climate change is affecting most is in the Ivory Coast, in places where the beans might not, the trees might not have might not should have existed in the first place. Last Hi, um, so I'm just kind of curious how much chocolate you eat a day, like one bar, five bars. Um, well, and, and also just being from Brooklyn, is there a kale chocolate yet? <laughs> <laughs> there should be, kale, uh, chocolate covered kale chips. Mm. Uh, you know what, I eat, uh, I'm mainly, a, I eat probably way more cocoa beans, or what I like to refer to as, cho just, I just call them chocolate beans. What's up with the word cocoa and cacao all the time? Just, they're just chocolate beans. Yeah. But uh, uh, I eat more of those, so we're testing roasts, eating the beans for, for testing roasts, uh, eating the beans as they're being ground down, um, eating raw beans when they come in. Uh, and then, of course, I eat lots of chocolate bars. We'll do, we do daily tastings amongst the staff uh, for quality and, and that sort of thing. Is but, there a lot of caffeine yeah. in chocolate? Uh, you'd think there would be, but uh, <laughs> the drug of choice in chocolate is not caffeine. You, it's theobromine. So a lot of you that, that call yourselves chocoholics are probably addicted to sugar. But if, <laughs> but if you're eating Mass Brothers chocolate, you've become addicted to theobromine, which is the drug that I'm the dealer of. So theobromine, where, where caffeine attacks your nervous system, theobromine is a, uh, is a muscle stimulant. Um, it's why it's, it's, theobromine is literally translated to food of gods. It's why cocoa was such a part of you know, uh, Inca and, and uh, Aztec Mayan royalty. And it was, it, was the, it was really the warrior drug they would take to feel fertile or to fight because it just, in fact, theobromine is extracted from cocoa beans um, for heart patients to lower blood pressure, all sorts of different things. So theobromine is, it's a really exciting, it's a really exciting drug that I'm really... That, that convinces me. Yeah. All right, Amen. one more question. Okay. Yeah. So I am a chocoholic, and yeah. I only eat the very darkest. So I'm, I'm like 85 or 90. Yeah. So it's really not sugar. But I have recipes that say cacao versus cocoa. Right. So please explain to me. Thank you. You know what? I don't, I, I don't know the answer to the, what the difference is, and I don't think anybody else does. So cacao is really the scientific name for the bean on a tree, right? Um, so let's, let's relate it to coffee. This is a big passion thing of mine, the, the, how to talk about chocolate. Coffee has that same word. It's called cofea. But if I stood up here and I said, ooh, what sort of varietal of cofea are you interested <laughs> in? You guys would all think that I was nuts. So um, cocoa traditionally is the powder, is what they're usually talking about, while cacao is the bean. Um, but uh, when it comes to uh, that number, that percentage on the bar, if it says cacao or cocoa afterwards, it's interchangeable. It's definitely interchangeable. In fact, one last thing on percentages that I think you guys might find interesting, my opinion on percentages is really, it's like it's likened to alcohol percentage in, in, in picking a wine. I encourage you all not to shop uh, thinking about percentages as long as it's in a certain like safe zone, which is sort of, sort of to me in the 70 to 85 point mark, but you wouldn't go into a wine shop and shop by alcohol percentage. So I think that as, as, the, as quality chocolate becomes more, you know, uh, you'll, becomes more abundant in your choices, 
you'll see that it will all kind of fit in a sort of maybe 60 to 85%. And you'll shop a bit based on alcohol percentage. But really, what you'll be, you'll just start learning the style of maker that you like. And you'll start learning the, uh, the you know, what kind of company you want to have a relationship with. Because you're going to get addicted to it, and you're going to be eating it all the time. <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you very much. Rick will be...